makes me angry a little bit sometimes is uh, or people don't think as fast as I do. I get frustrated. <laughs> I don't really get angry a lot, but I, I do get frustrated. What do you still hope to achieve? Oh, a lot. Um, I have a, a million ideas that run through my head all the time. Um, within the last year or so, we, we started doing our own podcast. And uh, that was a pretty fun drive. That was an idea we had. And then uh, we opened up Blue Rain Print Shop, which was another idea. Mm -hmm. And so expanding on those two things uh, are, are definitely something in the future that, that will be progressive. And then uh, we're we're looking to expand. So I, I don't feel like I've I've been in the business for 31 years at this point, and uh, I feel like I'm just getting started. I have mm. 30 years of knowledge that has a great base. So we want to expand into other cities, um, uh, one at a time if we can. But uh, I'm thinking more like Chicago or uh, Dallas, Houston, um, Salt Lake, or or Denver areas. Wow. Mm -hmm. You're listening to Artist with Brian. I'm Brian, here with... Leroy Garcia. Leroy is a podcaster and gallery owner. Anything else? Um, I'm an artist. Artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what kind of art do you do yourself? I, I sculpt in, in oil-based clay, and I, I get things cast in a bronze and in glass. I don't really promote myself in my gallery, but it, my work is... You can find hints of it there. Owner of Blue Rain, I heard you say... The passion to create is no different than the passion to collect. And I wanted to ask you, Leroy, do you identify more with your artists or your collectors? Um, because I've been involved in all aspects of art from the production end to the marketing end to the selling end. Um, they're, they're all important, the, the clients and the artists. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's a, a management of ego on both ends mm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, that's, where it gets really hard sometimes uh, to create that balance. Mm -hmm. As a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Um, as a kid, I knew that I didn't want to be a rancher, which is how I was raised. <laughs> yeah, I read you got kicked in the face at a young yeah. age. Well, yeah, I, uh, sorry about that. Um, I was uh, milking a cow once, and I, the, our cows were so uh, tame, uh, we didn't have to time up. And for some reason, I associated horses and cows as the same. A horse kicks back. But a cow kind of kicks in uh, towards the side. <laughs> and so I, was, I, I think I hit a sore while I was milking the cow. And she gave me a sidekick, knocked me out, broke my nose. And then she pooped all over me. <laughs> and my mom came in. She saw me passed out. She's all, I guess you don't have to go to school today. So <laughs> Was there a more important moment than that and you not wanting to be a rancher? Um, no, it's just physically hard work. Um, ironically, it's what created a base for my work ethic. But. Uh, the hard work of uh, digging ditches by hand, uh, constantly repairing uh, fences, digging post holes, and you know uh, everything it takes to do with cows, uh, branding, uh, <laughs> taking them to the cell, taking them to the slaughter. Yeah. Um, and as a kid, them. what age did you get put to work? I got put to work on all of it. Um, I remember at uh, 11 years old, I, I dug a ditch by hand, um, almost three three acres long. Oh my God! Yeah, and how many feet wide? Um, that was probably about three feet wide and about two feet down. Wow! Mm -hmm. You also were selling newspapers on top of this. Yes, I um, to help the family. I, I'm one of eleven. I'm the second oldest of eleven. Oh, children. second oldest. Yeah. And so my my dad worked at the uh, the mine up there in Cuesta, and uh, he he provided pretty well for us, but we we had to raise our own stuff for the most part. Uh, so l we live very modestly on the poorer end of the spectrum. So me and my brother, we always did whatever we could to contribute to the family. And one of those was selling news newspapers in the summer. It was great, but in the winter with 20 below zero sometimes, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Were you on a route or were you no, standing in the just, median? Just standing out there on the oh. street side, man, with the wind. Wow. Amazing. I, I had three paper routes at one point. For like a year or two, but mm -hmm. I held one for nine years. Yeah, <laughs> so I know what that's. I know what it's like. It's yeah. a, it's a job anybody in America can get, like in any small town at a very young age. Yes, it's a good signal. You mentioned you're one of twelve kids. You're the second oldest. Maybe limit. Second oldest. Mm -hmm. How do you think your birth order affected your personality? Um, the personality probably to take care of others, uh, take care of my brothers and sisters, uh, definitely is a strain in my life that is a good strain. You know, it's a, 
it's something that's woven in me because of that. Beautiful. Let's take a little break to play a game called Keeping Up with Georgia O'Keeffe. Okay. Uh, Blue Rain represents um, a lot of New Mexico, and mm -hmm. Georgia O'Keeffe is an iconic representer of the landscape. The stakes today are a VHS copy of Hoop Dreams and a very special donation from one of our previous guests, oil painter Claire Boyce. Oh, nice. These are her oil paintings in a five greeting card pack. You walk away with the VHS and those five greeting cards. Um, check them out. Buy them yourself through the Etsy link at one who cs clear on Instagram. Claire Boyce, one w h o c s clear. Leroy, at what age did Georgia O'Keeffe first visit New Mexico? Oh, I have no idea. I know that um, her and her husband had ventured out here a few times, uh, probably in her twenties, late twenties. Wow. I was going to say I would give you like plus or minus five years, so I think you won the game. It's age 29, yeah. year 1917. So you, wow. Uh, good job. So you'll walk home with uh, <laughs> nice something score. to keep Ooh. on your bookshelf. <laughs> Thank Sorry you, I didn't stick the, take that, the sticker off. Now my secret's out. I got it that, at Savers. That's okay. And then Claire's going to oh. be so happy that you got Wonderful. that. Wonderful. You know, I asked her, are you the next George O'Keefe? And you know what she said? What did she say? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Yeah. How yeah. confident. I thought that was pretty remarkable. She's well, very self-possessed. As an artist, you have to find your own path, but you can be inspired by greatness from others. Absolutely. Um, how'd you come up with the name Blue Rain? Um, well, I was married to a famous uh, artist who came from Santa Clara Pueblo. And uh, her grandmother was Mary Kane. And uh, the interpretation of Mary Kane's native name was Blue Rain. And so it inspired me. I thought that was really be beautiful. Um, living in Taos against the mountain. Uh, we I always loved the uh, the summer rains that come here. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at the... Uh, when it rains in Taos against the mountain, it's really blue and it's just beautiful. And uh, I started Blue Rain out of my dad's house. And it was my old bedroom. It's a thousand square foot... Uh, room on the North Pueblo entrance to Taos Pueblo. And so uh, when I was thinking of us, I, I was standing upstairs in that, in that room before we started bringing all the art in, and I was like, it just made sense to me. It was like uh, Blue Rain just is a natural environmental thing of Taos. <laughs> yeah, so it's a call, call back to your, your time growing up in Taos, yeah. and Taos as like a, a pillar of the state yeah. in terms of culture and location. Mm -hmm. uh, explain... Explain the importance of exclusivity to you in the gallery abyss. Um, I don't like to call it exclusivity. I like to call it empowerment. Okay. Um, that's a good question because it's a question that's never asked, especially to artists. Uh, a lot of artists these days don't see the importance of a gallery. Uh, however, you can, you can look at artists that are self-promoting versus artists that go through galleries and the artists that are in galleries and that are promoted, uh, their careers uh, go much higher, faster, and longer. Um, I had uh, a group show this year of retablos. It was uh, a, a collection that came in. There was 250 retablos. And most of the Hispanic artists, um, they, don't, they don't go through galleries. They just sell direct. And they're they're beautiful and they're talented artists, man. There 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 was some great retablos in there, and then you have uh, an, another great artist in there, uh, Nicolas Herrera, and he's he's more like outsider art, more lowbrow, mm. and his work will sell for five times more than what you would consider the best artist in in a Spanish market, and um, mm. not necessarily the caliber, but the the fact that Nicolas had ethics and stick. stick sticks with his gallery. He doesn't sell direct. So the gallery is put in a position to protect the price to, and they feel confident because of that to invest in him and to market him. Yeah. And that's where exclusivity is, but it's empowerment of the gallery system. Wow. Uh, when you let go of that uh, greed and learn to share, yeah. collectively you get a team behind you that pushes, 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 and you yeah. can, sky's the limit depending uh, on that commitment. You sign on and ride the wave. Yeah. There's a lot of shared resources. Yes. I mean, the Blue Rain brand yeah. is going to cross-sell. Like, collectors oh, yeah. of one artist is going to be introduced. 
Well, that's exactly what happens. And and not only that, the, the gallery, because we've been a gallery for almost 30 years, uh, we have influence amongst museums across the country. Yeah. So we, we can get uh, artists in museums faster. Well, that dovetails a little bit into this one, is why do some artists stay with you for five, ten years? I think your longest is even higher than that. Yeah. I have artists that have been with me. Uh, the the longest one is uh, Preston Singletary has been with me for 25 years or wow. 20 20 plus years. Um, some artists get there and, and last a few years. Um, the, I think it's the, the management of ego this is the biggest problem. Uh, sometimes we can lose sight of things, uh, whereas we want all the focus to ourselves or mm -hmm. we want more money. The money's not coming fast enough. You know, there's, there's all kinds of reasons. I guess in, in humanity, it's the grass is greener somewhere else. Uh, but I know this, that people who have stuck with me the longest have had the, the biggest and most successful careers, mm -hmm. including uh, my ex uh, and Tammy Garcia, mm. uh, Tony Abeda, uh, Preston Singletary, and, and our new generation that's coming up now. That uh, Like Jim Vogel has been with us about 20 years, but his prices are starting to really elevate mm. and selling out every show. Uh, Aaron Courier, uh, Doug West. Yeah, I wanted to ask you. Represent Doug West. Is he related to Sue West? Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't think so. Oh, okay. Um, Guest to be on this show for the listeners. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, Doug, Doug West is such a genius. I don't, I don't know if you heard my podcast with him, but um, you know, he he started his art career uh, doing all kinds of things. But when he was started doing paintings, he started with serigraphs, and um, to make one serigraph, he could get up to one hundred screens uh, cutouts to make the image the landscape which uh -huh. is mind-boggling yeah oh my gosh the patience to do that and he was prolific uh hard worker but a genius at what he's done and self-taught i picked up in listening to your material across the internet that you really admire artists mm -hmm. um, where does that come from i appreciate innovation and people that are pioneers especially um think about this town how many landscape artists there's thousands and thousands of landscape artists but if you're going to be a landscape artist in my gallery, uh, it's going to be different. You're going to be different. You're going to be unique. You're going to be uh, innovative in how you approach things. I see. So voice, mm -hmm. authentic. Well, to stand out, really, you need you need to have your own voice. Yeah. And it needs it needs to be distinctive and mm -hmm. yes, authentic. Um, you can't you can't get by just copycatting everything. Mm -hmm. um, it's okay in the beginning to use that as a reference to grow, mm -hmm. uh, but eventually you have to do your own thing. Well, what advice would you give for someone who paints? Um, I've had two oil painters on this show. One was repped by a gallery, but mm -hmm. there's someone who isn't repped yet. Uh, well, well uh, the, the only thing I would say, uh, well, there's probably a lot I could say, but um, being an artist uh, and being a good artist is about practice, practice, practice. You have to eat it, live it, drink it, you know, it, uh, go to bed with those ideas and think and then get back in the next morning and practice, practice, practice. And uh, all of these artists have developed by copying or imitating things. In the beginning, they would start by copying Mickey Mouse, you know, drawing, drawing Mickey Mouse. So you start by copying stuff. Yeah. And eventually you, you get more creative and creative, but that's developing with practice, 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 and learning to be inspired by many other sources. Uh -huh. And so there's a visual education that has to happen. You need to go to, to galleries or um, museums to look at aesthetics of all the masters and get familiar with that before you can even elevate yourself. I think about like um, uh, artists like Tony Abeda. Uh, Tony Abeda spent years and years of schooling. Uh, he got his master's degree, I think, at NYU. Um, but the guy was, he, he, he studies all the masters. He knows everything. Uh, he, he, he looks at what's innovative, and then he applies it in his own way. Uh -huh. And he's always been able to do that. And that's uh -huh. why he has longevity in his career. Longevity. And also, the other thing I would say that sometimes an artist will develop a distinct style and stick with that style and never deviate. And I think the the way for longevity in that market is to be constantly innovative, to not rest on your laurels. Yeah. Because well, that can burn out. One of my questions for you as a gallery owner was, what's the biggest adaptation you've made or had to make in your career that's driven your success? 
Um, the, uh, the, 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 biz, the biggest thing for me is me acknowledging that I, don't, I do not know everything. Uh -huh. So I surround myself with people that are idea people as well. Uh -huh. And so it's, it's a, a constant interaction. Uh, yes, in the end, I make the final decision, but uh, everybody has an opinion and they interject. And running a gallery is no differently than running your art career. <laughs> yeah. That innovation is important, how you do things. Like now we've integrated podcasts, uh, you know, of how we in, uh, integrate videos and, and all kinds of things, blogs. Yeah, you started a print shop, you started a YouTube channel, you got a podcast, you have a uh, artist speaking series on the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. I mean, out of this mix, what's your priority right now? And all of it. All of it. What's yeah. what needs the most work? What are you uh Well, we're what's well, newest? Well, we're uh, with the with the podcast, we're going to go in a uh, we're going to start integrating into uh interviewing collectors and talking about their journeys. Um I fortunately uh, interviewed my two best friends and my two biggest collectors, um, and, and that po podcast will be coming out. And I'm so thankful we did that. Um, I had a 25-year history with them mm -hmm. in journey and collecting art. And uh, just the other day, one of them passed away unexpectedly. So it's important to document some of that history of mm -hmm. Blue Rain, the journey that these collectors have taken mm -hmm. uh, to get there. Uh, so we're, we're, that's that's another innovative uh, thought to go down that. And uh, we also want to go to artist studios and, and kind of talk to the artists in their environment, but also visually show what how, how their process is how they're doing things, how they construct things. Mm -hmm. Like going to Billy Shanks in, in the podcast, we're talking about slides and how he constructs his scenes through uh, negative slides. Uh, talking about it, but actually showing it is also another mm -hmm. big venue. Uh, it, to me, it's about educating people because a lot of people come in, they're like, they don't even know what they're looking at. And uh, so it's, it's important to educate. And that's what we do 90% of the time, we educate. Well, I think um, it's so smart that you've got video on your YouTube because yeah. people get to see you yeah. in person, basically, and hear you talk and see you talk before they visit Santa Fe, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's a really smart it's, move. It's been, uh, you know, very, very important. We had a, a podcast with uh, Catherine Stedham, and uh, we had a painting hanging behind her. We had a client over 20 years ago who, who came to the gallery and bought a few things and then disappeared. We didn't see him. But he... Or somehow got a hold of that podcast, fell in love with the painting. And before we knew it, there was like 15 major commissions that came out of that. From him? Yeah, just from that one oh, collector. Oh, wow. Yeah. When it rains, it pours. Yeah. So that's what, is that the gallery business looking for the person who really gets it and can afford to support the artist? Yeah. Uh, what we're really after is a younger uh, age demographic. Huh. And that's where the podcasts really fit in. Interesting. Um, when I started, I was in my early 20s uh, my average collector was in the late 50s early 60s mm -hmm. 70s 80s uh, most of them are, are passing on yeah. or they're getting rid of their collections huh. and there's not enough people behind <laughs> to absorb those collections and so you you see downward pressure on the market uh you know mm -hmm. deflating the prices because of that so you're trying to cultivate younger artists too a younger artists a fresher well, view of the uh, Mexico? as long as they're as long as they're innovative and yeah. that's hard sometimes i can see that developing uh-huh and uh, we'll, we'll take a risk on a younger artist. But mostly in the stable now, we have established artists. Yeah. That's so neat. It's kind of like producing a movie. I'm a fledgling indie film producer. Oh, nice. And you're really a facilitator. You're a promoter. Yeah. You got to believe in the people you sign on. And then yeah. you, you kind of die for them out in yeah. the public. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, how do you reconcile the New Mexico that collectors expect <laughs> versus the New Mexico you experienced living here all your life. Well, the the people that collect art based on how they feel about uh, it's a romantic view of what the West was. Hmm. Um, and it, you know, little places like Santa Fe and Taos still have that feel to them. Um, you can walk down the streets of Taos and, and think about what were what were the Taos founders thinking, what inspired them. Uh, Mostly it's the light. I mean, I was talking about the Taos Pueblo how, or the mountain mm -hmm. uh, juxtaposed from the, the my house where I started Blue Rain. Uh, just the ambient light is mm -hmm. just amazing out there. Yeah. Um, so there, there's there's a cross, you know, where, where that parallels. And then there's the reality of growing up there, which was impoverished. You know, mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of our people are poor and live way below the poverty line. And... Um, 
that, yeah, that's not really talked about or. Mm-hmm. You Do you know, think you can find an artist that lived a similar experience that's out yeah. somewhere in the outlying? Well, the, rural the, the one, the one uh, the artist that I I represent that really captures that a way of life that I remember growing up that is leaving us fast, and that's Jim Vogel. Uh, Jim Vogel really captures uh, the lifestyle of mainly the Hispanic culture of northern New Mexico. Mm-hmm. And you say he's leaving us fast, or the culture is? The so culture, he's, the he's, culture is dissipating be, with technologies and all this stuff. Yeah, so you know the the old far, the old ways of farming and using the ditch. Mm-hmm. It, that's that's important. We call that the acequia. Mm-hmm. Uh, but knowing the rules of the ditch, who can use the water, when the water can be used, and uh, in drought, who gets to use water first, the animals, you know, mm-hmm. all that stuff um, he brings out in his paintings. Yeah. And that's that stuff that's fleeting. Um, there's one uh, painting that he did, uh, Mira Mira, and uh, it had these kids playing in a, in a courtyard. And it reminded me of being in my grandpa's house. And there's a little courtyard uh, with other houses that, you know, surround it. It's like a little plaza. And uh, we'd go there and, and play with old to- toys like marbles. Uh-huh. You know, nobody yeah. plays with marbles anymore. I love marbles. And then, uh, so we, we, there was another game where we'd uh, take an old uh, wagon wheel, the steel around it, and there would be another iron, a uh, long iron with a fork. And the the goal was to push the, the ring with the the fork without it uh, falling down. Uh-huh. And that that's an old game that's gone. Yeah. But uh, he captured all that oh, stuff. Oh, he does? Yes, oh, he's brilliant. captured that, yeah. Amazing. So, mm-hmm. so there really isn't that much cognitive dissonance. I thought there might be a you might be torn in two different directions, but it sounds like you're able to express. You're just able to be yourself and really do everything for all the stakeholders. Yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, that's a part of my life to have balance on. What's the single most important thing you learned on season one that's impacting season two of the podcast? Um, my daughter. Is always on me. She's like, stop saying um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So there, yeah. there's there's technical things that you can practice on. Uh, we uh, we had we had some hard uh, we had hard lessons to learn. Like I told you one time, we did a podcast with uh, one of my best friends, uh, Stetson Haniamtoa, and uh, we spent about an hour. And then, uh, like twenty minutes later, <laughs> after he left, Leah's like, Dad, there was no chip. <laughs> we didn't record it. So we had to call him back in and redo that process, and he he was gracious and uh, did that. Yeah, cool. Yeah, practical problems. I I actually missed the first question on this. I have it backed up on my phone though, so uh, we can rerun it at the end, or yeah. I can splice it. Whatever in. you want to. Um, so something I've said I think on this show is that promotion is fifty one percent of it, and this is me as an artist communing here over the radio waves with other artists. Leroy is fifty one percent. Or is promotion fifty one percent of it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I think uh, promote without promotion, how do you get people to recognize your work? Yeah. You know? So these all these uh, mediums like podcasts or shows. You, if you're self promoted, you you look for booth shows. You you want to get your work out there. You, that's the only way you're going to have a commercial success. Yeah. Although you know, I I did. Uh, I have a very famous uh, client uh, and friend, uh, David Valdez, who I interviewed, and he he had an uncle who started the help. With, he he was kind of the foundation of uh, the Chicano art movement in East LA, and uh, this man painted for like forty years, and then wasn't concerned about commercial success. He just liked to paint, and so he did about seven hundred paintings, never sold one. Mm. And so now that collection comes through Blue Rain. But I, I can mm-hmm. appreciate that. I'm actually doing a, a, a series of sculptures, hopefully, to be released uh, late spring. Um, oh, exciting. Personally. Uh, this next year, yeah. Yeah. So how how much time do you get to spend on sculpting? Uh, not much. I, I'm i always uh, <laughs> on the road. It's hard. Yeah, I yeah. just have to physically make time. At least once I have the idea, though, I can get through it pretty quick. Do you think owning a gallery is an artistic pursuit? Yeah, it is because you're 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 dealing with aesthetic, yeah. How things are presented, how th- how uh, people visually see things on the wall or on a pedestal, or is the light hitting something proper? You know? Yeah, and what what success looks like is pretty amorphous. Yes. Obviously, it, sales it, matter. It's always but, amorphic. It, it yeah. always has been. <laughs> I had a I had a writer once that I hired, and 
um, she was interviewing me. She she threw up her hands. She says, "You're too amorphic for me." I'm like, <laughs> I had to look the word word up. I was like, "Oh yeah, yeah that's you know, funny. I am. Um, I I am a shotgun blast, and yeah. uh, I surround myself with uh, laser beams." Interesting. So you really believe in building yeah. the right team? Yeah, me too. Amen to that. Uh, what's your favorite New Mexico legend or story or myth? Having been here all your life, um, my. I, I love, uh, there's two things. Well, of course, you have La Llorona, <laughs> right? Uh-huh. You know, that scary lady that's going to come and get you. Looking, yeah, looking I, drink, I drink a beer every Wednesday called La Llorona. <laughs> I had to look it up, so I, I vaguely understand. Yeah, yeah. And, and then the other the other thing I love uh, is my personal history of New Mexico. My my two, my two lines, uh, or four lines, that are here. Um, Three of which came to New Mexico when uh, early 1500s, and they were. Uh, you have to ask the question: Why did they come here so fast? Yeah, and and uh, it was to get away from the Inquisition. Um, they were crypto Jews, and then um, the other the other line uh, was directly sent here from the King of Spain. Uh, mm-hmm. My one of my grandfathers, uh, Bernardo uh, Miera y Pacheco. And uh, he made the entire uh, first maps of this entire southwest region. And uh, you can find his uh, his maps in the History Museum of New Mexico. That's beautiful. We've actually published a book on him. And then also in Mexico City and in Spain, you can see his maps. They're original oil paintings. Oil painted maps. Mm-hmm. And he was one of the first Santeros here, too. Uh, one of it, he did an altar for a church, and it's now in the Cristo Rey Church here on Canyon Road. But he carved that altar in uh, 1750. And then uh, one other thing that I have is I, I have a, a great grandmother who was Navajo, uh, who was kidnapped by Apaches mm. and sold as a slave. They didn't call that, they called it adoption, but they basically sold her to a Spanish, Spanish family. So that's how I have my native blood. So I'm about quarter native, a quarter Hispanic, and then the rest is that English and Irish. Yeah, mix. I, I heard <laughs> Irish and German or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Did you have a gallery on Canyon Road at some point, or do you still do? No, no. Uh, we had a gallery on Lincoln Avenue for about 15 years. Okay, and and you expect this one on in the rail yard to become your biggest and most trafficked. Um, it already it already, it has already surpassed where I left. Um, I left that place because of the the rents were just too high. It's crazy. Um, uh, versus where I'm at, you get um, a much bigger building. Well, I I was renting about the same square footage. Okay. Uh, but this building uh, is beautiful. It was built as a gallery. It was uh-huh. one of the few in this city that were built as a gallery, and uh, I mean it has a retractable roof. <laughs> You really? know, uh-huh. wow! All the all the glass in there is UV protected, so I don't yeah. have to worry about fades on paperwork or anything. And uh, it, it's just oh yeah, and it, you wouldn't think this in a gallery, but most galleries just have sheetrock or uh, adobe stucco yeah. around here. But my walls in that gallery have plywood behind all the sheetrock, so installs are really fast. Plywood behind all the sheetrock. Ah, you can screw in so the plywood. So you can screw in, you can hang heavy stuff uh, without tearing up the walls. Neat. And, uh, I mean, it's really tall, tall walls. Yeah, there are high ceilings inside. 25, 25 feet. Yeah, it's a majestic building. I walk past it all the time, and it really stands out. Um, visitors to Santa Fe got to check it out. Wander away from the plaza. Yeah. Come to the rail yard, eat at a Pontia. Yeah. Visit Blue Rain. Do you mind if we go to the clay pot for a few minutes? Sure. Well, these are, this is a collection of fan questions that I'll pull out one at a time at random. Some are a little odd. First fan question for Leroy. No, you don't get that. It's what? Well, no, you do. What brought you to Santa Fe? Um, <clears throat> what brought me to Santa Fe? I was happy in Taos. Uh, my my wife at the time and Antonio Beto uh, came to me and they said we're we're not happy with just Taos. We want we want a bigger platform. So I'm like okay. So I went over here and hunted it out and. Uh, I didn't realize, you know, at that time, there was not a gallery like Blue Rain. Mm. There's a lot of imitation going on now from what we set at that time. But we we integrated um, fine art paintings with, with pottery and kachinas and jewelry. And, I mean, it was a full scale. We hit every base 
you could get in a gallery. Mm -hmm. And so our first Indian market over there, it, it was a sea of red dots. We, I did not expect that. It was everything sold out. Mm. Everybody was happy uh, millions of dollars in the week. Uh, those were crazy times. Millions of dollars in a week. Mm -hmm. So you came here to grow? Yeah. As a gallery owner. I didn't realize what the growth was uh, till, I, till I listened to those two, and uh, they gave me good inspiration. Amazing. Second fan question, biggest lie you've told your mother? Um, I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was too scared to, too. The biggest lie I've told my mother, I don't know. Probably that I, I think I threw a pencil sharpener away one time. Yeah. <laughs> Just to see, like, if I don't know. I'm just going to stick young. with my line. I didn't do that. Sorry. You didn't do that. <laughs> um, who do you want to call out right now as an upcoming guest on this show? Um, you should do Aaron Courier. You would like that. Aaron Courier? Mm -hmm. Is he one of your artists? She. Oh, she. Sorry. Yeah. Is she one of your artists? Yes. Okay. Neat. Aaron, Aaron, you'll like her. She lives here in Santa Fe. Um, remember, I was talking about pioneer and innovation. Mm. Um, she's found a way to be a collage artist, uh, with great messaging. A lot of it's social political commentary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, she collects trash from all over the world mm -hmm. and puts it around the figures and it's just beautiful stuff. You'll, you'd like that. Neat. Aaron Courier. I'll look her up. How would your enemies criticize you? <laughs> that I'm too controlling. <laughs> oh yeah yeah that's where does that come from that that comes from me asking them to empower the gallery as artists <laughs> so that's sometimes they leave because they don't they don't want to play the game. oh it's this big the exclusivity is yes. the pivot point oh it's, yeah the whole thing rests on this well it, it does because yeah. you're either going to empower us or you're not mm -hmm. we're not going to be stuck competing with you in a direct conduit yeah so yeah millions of dollars in a week guys uh, final question from the clay pot for Leroy. Have you ever spotted George R. R. Martin in town? Um, I, I'm lucky that I get to be involved with the museum foundation of New Mexico. So, uh, I've, I've, I've never met him, but I've been in the same room with him. Same room. So mm -hmm. you've spotted him. Yeah. Very cool. And I've, obviously I've been to his, uh, little, um, uh, what do they call that? The, the John Cocteau. Yeah, the John Cocteau And he's got theater. Beastly Books next yeah, door yeah. where he sells all the Game of Thrones yes. in print, which is a cool side-by-side -side yes. co-owned business <laughs> for an author. Um, so I'm going to shout out your Instagram. You've got two. You've got Blue Rain Gallery, all one word for the gallery. You've got Blue Rain Print Shop for the print shop. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say, we haven't discussed it, but you said during COVID you made this and some of your artists were receiving up to $500 a month in income. Yeah. Just off prints. Just, just off what we're doing. Yeah. And that's a huge deal because these commissions from sales of big sales of pieces are sort of feast and famine. Well, some of our artists are young mm -hmm. and um, they're they're like still one foot in and one foot out. One foot in the gallery, but one foot having to work as part-time artists or part-time whatever. Mm -hmm. And so especially for those uh, that are struggling, it... it it, you know, three to five hundred doesn't sound like a lot, but uh, it is a lot. It's and a it, lot. And it's it two. Help. It's two serving shifts you don't have to do. Yeah, yeah. So it's it, it does help. Uh -huh. And uh, if we could get them all to promote it more, <laughs> it would grow even even bigger than it is. Yeah, interesting. So, oh, if you could get the artists themselves. Yeah, yeah. there's a little. Yeah, Cause interesting. They, it, you know, all this stuff is symbiotic. We we yeah. have to work together. You just got to find the resonance. Yeah. There's some part of the message that everyone will latch onto and love to share. Yeah. Uh, You've got a YouTube channel, Blue Rain Gallery as well. Mm -hmm. All one word. Yes. Go see Leroy in the flesh. And the final question, or no. So how can uh, how does my audience help you, Leroy? What's the single most important thing they can do right now? Um, you know, just you, you just bring, come to the gallery and enjoy beautiful art and invite your friends. Oh, cool. Walk through. It's not yeah. like an online ask. Visit. Yeah. See yeah. it. Visit. Experience see it. it. Mm-hmm. I, it is. I want to. I want to walk through because I think it's going to be quite an experience for all these voices to be collected together and surrounding me. Yeah, that sounds like quite an experience. Uh, last question before we go: If there's one thing you could change about this podcast, what would it be? Uh, I think it's pretty good. You have you have very thoughtful questions. Uh, you you did your research, and uh, uh, may you have much success as you go forward. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, let's do 
let's do the uh, let's do the co- first two questions just so I make sure I have them. This okay. is back up. What gets you up in the morning? My wife and my dogs, and then my driveway. <laughs> what gets you angry? Uh, the, the angry. Uh, You're listening. Is, the artist is Brian. I think you talked about that one. I'm Brian here with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Jeff Gonzalez. Jeff is a filmmaker, sound editor, music producer. I dig it, man. I say we try it for season three. Do you want it at the beginning and the end? Yeah, I think it'll sound great. I say I say, I thank you every episode at the end. Like, I'll shout out your Instagram handle for your music if you have one. To cater to your taste. To cater to your taste.